Thank you for being here during a very busy time as you're starting off your school year. Um, my name is Stephanie Woodley. I'm the grant coordinator for the Illinois Elevating Special Educators Network. And we are really here to provide a targeted professional development for special educators, really all about increasing the outcomes of students with disabilities. So we know that that takes a village and not just special educators, but also our general education peers, our related uh, support personnel. And a big part of that is parents. Um, we heard from uh, several school districts and cooperatives that we were working with that they were very interested in potentially starting some type of family advisory committee or council to help involve um, parents of students who have IEPs and ways in which to do that, ways in which to select those people and just how to get started. Um, so we are very thankful that Megan uh, Moody of Family Matters Parent Training Information Center um, very happily jumped right on board and they are one of our partners and we're just trying to really increase that. And she was like, yes, I would love to help support districts as thinking about this and then also talking about ways um, towards the end of if you want follow up or different things like that, how we can support you as IESC Network, but also how potentially Megan and her staff at Family Matters can support you as well. If this is something that you um, really want to have within your district, within your school, or whatever you are thinking. So I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Megan. Stephanie, thank you. And thank you all for, I do tell you that I feel like it is such a busy time of year and that you're still on here with me to talk about family advisory councils. So I feel like I need to be uber entertaining. So I'm really going to try hard to make this not painful and as interesting as possible. But I, um, I am with Family Matters Parent Training and Information Center. I'm a mom to a 24 year old with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I always start with that because there's no way that that doesn't shift my perspective a little bit. Um, and I, I may be one of the few people who loves to talk about family advisory councils. Um, I come to this from uh, the healthcare setting. Hi, Melissa. And um, they really led the way in patient and family advisory councils. And so to see that both developmental disability providers and educators are starting to embrace the idea that the family voice can really shift the way we deliver services is exciting to me. So with that, I'm going to share my uh, screen. The slides are pretty dense because I wanted you to have the resources in them. I'm not going to go through all of the information on every slide, but I wanted you to be able to look back at it. So um, I apologize if it looks like there's a lot on every slide or a lot of resources. It was really just because I wanted you to have access to it um, after the fact. So Family Matters, I do have to tell you, is not a legal services agency. We work with families um, and teachers and school districts to ensure that there's effective collaboration, that parents understand the special education system, the basics of being involved in their student's IEP, self-advocacy, things like that. But we do not provide legal advice. We don't interpret legal guidance. Um, so it's important that we say that out loud, as many of you who are in the similar situation as us in that. What we do do is we provide an education advocacy helpline. We do one-to-one -one support for families. So if you have a family, for example, who's struggling, let's say, with goal writing in their IEP um, or has an individual who's struggling behaviorally and needs some assistance with that, we can connect them to resources. We do IEP reviews. We help with goals, um, really run the gamut of sort of parent-to-parent -parent support. We hold the educational surrogate parent um, program through ISBE. So we ensure that ESPs are trained in the state of Illinois and are available to students who don't have parents to help them make educational decisions. We have what's called Compass. Um, it's a volunteer training program for parents to support other parents. We have a DAISY data educational program. And I know um, educators love data or hate data. It depends on the day that I ask you, but um, this helps parents interpret data and use it for decision-making around their child and systemically within the school district. So that can be something that's useful to you as you move forward um, with a family advisory council. We do a lot of trainings. Um, we have self-advocate blogs, so individuals with in intellectual disabilities who do vlogs and blogs for us, um, quarter new newsletters. We do a lot around transition, and we have a monthly podcast. So I would encourage you to check out our website. We're one of two federally funded parent training and information centers. So we cover 94 counties outside of Chicago, and then Family Resource Center on Disabilities, FRCD, covers the eight counties in Chicago. So we have similar missions. Um, and 
just depending on where a family falls, is where you would direct them. So today I just want to explore what family-centered care is, uh, talk about some barriers that you are likely to run into as you try to implement a family advisory council uh, with those core tenants. I can talk to you a little bit about family advisors and how they play a role in the school system and sort of talk you through five initial considerations that may kind of help make or break this process. So family-centered care, whether it's in healthcare or intellectual disabilities um, or sc the school system is based around these tenets, transparency and open information sharing, participation and planning, collaboration, and dignity and respect. Um, and that does not shift depending on what environment we're working on. That is across the board. And so taking these and sort of figuring out how can I build a family advisory council that implements and uses the lens of dignity, respect, communication, transparency, and collaboration. That's sort of taking the idea into practice is what you're working on. And an another way that I've always thought about it and, and have seen um, that light bulb moment for people is families are often, whether it's healthcare or the school system, they're the recipient of services. So things are happening and they're receiving those services, whether it be their individual classroom services or district-wide services, they're getting those services delivered to them to help them have a full life in the school system. When you shift to the advisor model, families are now collaborators. They're evaluating. They're fully a part of making that system work in a way that meets their needs versus individually receiving those supports. And that's to me, the easiest way to think about it um, and will help you sort of frame what you want to do with a family advisory council. Now, I won't dig into this too much other than the reason I put this out here is the way family-centered care, the evolution of family-centered care in the healthcare system, because I, I think sometimes people hear, you've got family members sitting on hiring committees, you know, what, what are you talking about? You've got family members looking at curriculums. Um, the way that I look at this is if it can be done in the healthcare system, it can absolutely be done in the school system. Um, because some of the vulnerabilities that are in the healthcare system are unique to that system, but we are still able to bring families in as advisors. Um, and there's more safety. There's more of a safety net in the school system than there is in the healthcare system. And so I think it's one of those things where there's some discomfort around that. Um, and I remember significant discomfort around it when we were in the healthcare system. When we said to, for example, a nursing staff, we're going to have families sit with you while you change shift, and you talk about the patient. And we're going to let them share their, what they're saying and their concerns. You can imagine that that feeling was like, you're going to do what? Like that that just felt so unsafe and uncomfortable to them because it's different. And though the model that we use in the school system is a little bit different than that, it does, there is sort of a culture shift of from families receiving again services to families really participating in quality improvement work. Now, this is one of those that I threw in there for you to look back at later. It will it is, a to me, like a great snapshot of the process, um, but I'm not going to dig into it too much right now because we'll get caught up in it and we won't make uh, forward progress, but know that it's in there. So I would love to know if you don't mind putting in the chat what your current comfort level is. And there's no right answer to this. To be honest, many years ago, I would have absolutely been sitting at one. Um, but what's your current comfort level with partner with families. One, being very uncomfortable, haven't had families in an advisor role before, not feeling confident about it being done well, all the way through to, I feel super confident about it. I think families can really be super helpful to us. Um, I think they're critical. Where are you all at with that? I keep shifting this around to try to, there we go. Let's see. 1. I appreciate 5. the 1.75. <laughs> I love that. That's perfect. 1.75. That's perfect. Um, this is just an initial sort of feeling about kind of, okay, where are you at? Um, but keep this in mind as we move forward, um, how you can shift from, ooh, I'm pretty uncomfortable to um, all the way through of like, well, you know, I think we could move an entire system to the point of um, getting comfortable with this process. Hang on one second. It does not want to move. There we go. So 
one of the things that I'm going to ask you to do, not today, but to, once you sort of identify your school team, not with families present, um, is to do a family engagement assessment. And that will give you a snapshot of where are we at? What do we need to do? What are some surprising things we're finding, for example, in our culture about welcoming families systemically? And it will give you a good base, a starting point for these discussions. So as you talk about readiness, there's a few things, just core things to consider. One is, is everybody open to the process? Um, this really is a top-down process. So if the school administration is not fully bought into the idea of families participating, participating as advisors, it is very difficult for individual classrooms to move that ball. That administration openness matters a lot. Uh, it is a long game process. So I would say you're really wanting to look at this over the course of 18 months. Um, it doesn't move very quickly. You want to find two staff members who are all in, who love the idea of family advisors, who love the idea of partnering with families, who think it can make a really big difference in the school system. Um, those two staff members are your sort of all in folks who you'll train to really take this process on. I would encourage you to attend other family advisory councils in your area if you happen to have a school. Um, sometimes we see um, co-ops who are doing this. You might want to tap into them just to watch how it works at other places. Now, if you go to 10 family advisory councils, they're all going to look very different. Um, and that comes back to the question of why are you running a family advisory council? And we'll talk about that. But Everybody's doing this for different reasons and targeting different areas, but it's worth taking a look at what's out there um, and then really decide, OK, do we have the time to put in a process that's really going to make the change that we want to make? Because it is an investment in time. If you're getting asked as you bring this up, why? Why would we do this? What do families bring to the table? What do self-advocates bring to the table that we don't already have in terms of professional expertise? Um, families bring a different context, a different lens. Um, your lens as a family member outside of work is different than your lens as a professional educator. Um, they have a history with students and within the school system um, that might give us some insight as to why certain things work or don't work that we can't get without asking them. Um, they're going to share their comfort level with certain policies and practices that we can't get without, without asking them. Self-advocates can share their personal vision for what it might look like to have a process that really works for them versus them fitting themselves into a process that's in place um, historically at a school. They can share their lived experiences and share barriers that they consistently run into. And those are all things that can be moved and changed. But if we don't ask them to sit at the table with us, it's difficult to get that information. We make a lot of assumptions. And on that, here are some things we hear very frequently about families. Um, that I think give us a little bit of insight into why it might be helpful to have families at the table to dig into some of this. Um, we make judgments about families being over or under involved in the school system, uh, that they don't understand the complexity of the system, why we can't change certain things. Um, that can be frustrating. Families um, sometimes come to the table with what school staff perceive are unrealistic expectations or not in line with what is possible. Um, there's a perception sometimes that families of students with significant disabilities are difficult or hypervigilant. That often comes as we, as we know from years and years and years of navigating systems where the system hasn't worked well for them. Um, and sometimes families are judged to be in denial about how significant an individual's challenges are. We often see that around issues of least restrictive environment and inclusion, um, and that there's a disconnect between the school system and the family about how those challenges can be appropriately accommodated um, in an inclusive environment. So things like that, but we do make a lot of judgment of families. When we ask families, what are some barriers that you see that you wish could be changed? Um, I only feel like they communicate with me when there's a problem. I feel like the IEP team is frustrated with me. There's always tension in the room. I can always feel that uh, tension in the room. And I think that system, that IEP system, while it's very protective and critical, um, all of you can probably relate to walking into an IEP meeting, just sort of feeling the heaviness in the air. Um, that can be overwhelming to families and they carry that from year to year and they start dreading those processes. 
Um, no one returns my call. I don't know what to do anymore. I leave messages and send emails. I can't reach anyone. I'm overwhelmed, but I want to be included in all this rolls out. And that was a, a parent who had a child who had complex medical needs, um, who was feeling as though she had kind of burnt out her relationships with the school and to the point that she wasn't really being included in core decisions about her child's well-being. Um, but you can see the common themes, lack of inclusion and communication. Those are barriers that families who are receiving direct services identify, not necessarily families who are participating in school system change, which is what we're trying to do. So the barriers that we see, and I, I'm guessing all of you can relate to these, uh, we tend to provide for instead of with, or at least historically, that's what we did. Um, sometimes lack consideration around diversity, culture, equity, though we definitely see a significant shift in that. And we see school systems really investing in improving that those processes and being far more in tune with the needs of uh, students from diverse cultures. Assumptions about family knowledge, and that goes both ways. So sometimes we assume that families who have been navigating the system for a long time really understand it quite well. And sometimes we go the other way and we assume that a family, for example, who isn't showing up to IEP meetings isn't showing up because they don't understand it and they don't have that knowledge base. Um, but regardless, we're making assumptions about why a family is or isn't participating. And it would be helpful to actually know and have those conversations with families um, because systems can be changed to support them better and to engage them at a higher level. Uh, families tend to see professionals as experts and experts tend to see professionals as experts. Um, I was looking at a social media post not long ago and um, a parent was saying, I'm not really sure why, but when we went to my IEP meeting, the last couple of times, the school um, administrator said, we're experts in this. We're experts in providing that service. And it's very possible that that was being presented as a reassurance. Like we know what we're doing. You can trust us. Your child is safe. Uh, but she didn't know whether to interpret it that way or to interpret it as um, I need you to, you know, sit back down and defer to us. And she was so um, concerned about what that meant for their relationship and how to respond to that. Um, time is a barrier. Families don't have enough time. Professionals absolutely don't have enough time. So that can sometimes be a barrier to how you roll systems out like this. There's limited resources. Um, and the biggest one, I think, is just lack of experience in including families in this way. So when I say SA, I'm talking about self-advocates, um, and that's what we'll, we'll shift to. So what does a family-centered school system look like? Uh, individuals and families work in partnership to define goals. We protect individual privacy. Uh, families are involved in all levels of decision-making. Communication is consistent, open, and supportive. Constructive feedback is not only welcome, but invited, and services are easy to understand and access. Now, I can't see all of you right now because of the way I have the system set up, but um, I would love to sort of have a sense of what, when you look at that list, are there things on there where you think, gosh, we're really great at this, and other things where you're thinking, mm, we have some room to grow. The one that we saw consistently both in other school systems and in the healthcare setting is the highlighted statement. Constructive feedback is not only welcomed, but invited and valued. So you can imagine if a family comes to family advisory council and on the agenda, let's say during um, open topic sharing, they share a concern that they've run into. And the response is, well, we wouldn't have done that. Or that's not standard practice. I don't know why that happened. Or I don't, I don't think you're interpreting that the right way. Immediately, we've taken a process which should have been open and we've invited people to the table, but then we've said, Again, we, the message we send is we're the experts. Uh, what you're saying can't be valid based on my context of experience. And so that is one where you really have to be careful. And what you can, when you, we talked about selecting the all in staff members, you need an all in staff member who right there can hear and sometimes redirect the conversation to ensure that when those advisors are at the table sharing their experiences, that it's welcomed and that it's not met in a defensive manner. The ultimate experience in family advisors that you have to sort of dig into is do the family experiences and the perspectives align with what the school system thinks family experiences and perspectives are. And this process will help you with that. So I'm not gonna read this, but this is what families tell us they need in systems. And this is across the board, what we see as 
gaps and concerns that families share. Um, and a lot of it is around community resources, the ability to change how systems are delivered, um, DEI issues, and equal access. So this is how I break it down. And we're gonna kind of get into the nuts and bolts of it as we go now. I break it down into systems, service, and support. How you use families in the school system. So systems are things like how are families included in the school system? Um, do they partner in protocol, uh, protocol and process design? And is the system designed in a way that sends the message to all families, not just families who are already involved? Uh, your knowledge is important to us. Your experience is important. We cannot provide good service without you sharing that with us. Then you shift to a service perspective. And in this role, families and self-advocates are leaders in supporting other families. So think about kind of peer mentor programs. Families or self-advocates help develop programs and curriculum. They're reviewers of curriculum. They're advisors. And then we have support which is families as full participants in the design of their own processes. So um, for example, am I a full participant in the design of my, my adult daughter's processes, but it's specific to her, it's not as systemic. Um, they're decision makers around their own supports and they participate in the evaluation of their own supports. And that's a gap that we see in the school system across the board. Do families participate in evaluating both how they're receiving services and how, for example, how is that IEP working for them? And more systemically, how is the school system working for them? So aside from just some glances that we take through surveys from the state, um, we don't often get a lot of feedback from families about how processes work for them. So take a glance at this, and this will help you when we talked back at the beginning about assessing readiness, this will give you, this is just a snapshot, um, very generalized snapshot. When you start at the bottom left, you talk about self-advocate. So for example, my daughter, is she being provided high quality supports in the school system? Okay, so that's the lowest level of family engagement. We go up a step. Is the family being invited to share information and preferences about their loved one or their student? We go up another step. Is the family invited to participate on a family advisory board or a self-advocate board to share their experiences more globally? So it's not about them per se, but it's more broad than that. You can see go up another step. Are families then um, from an advisory board asked to review curriculum, processes, and offer feedback regularly? And lastly, are they an integral, and that's the most important word, integral to program and system functioning? They hire they sit on staffing committees, they sit on school boards, advisory councils, and they are always included in policy and process change. Um, and that doesn't just mean process change um, that, for example, might go through a school board. It means process change in what's happening in the lunchroom, what's happening in the PE program, things that might impact students, but we wouldn't normally ask families about. They can act as educators, advisors, volunteers, mentors, and reviewers. And I say this only because you might get asked, why do, why do you care about this? Why do you want to start a family advisory council? And one of the things is to talk about what roles families can play versus what roles they might be playing now. I put a few examples in here. Again, more talking points than anything else, but um, families in direct service. This is talking about families who participate in advocacy around their own students' needs. So family and define who their family consists of. That's that's one I always use because I think it's one that we don't think about. Are families allowed to define who is in their family system, in the school system, who's part of decision-making for them? And that as families become more diverse, that changes and shifts a lot. And how do we make sure we understand how any individual student or family defines their family? And then we talk about moving into more action steps. Can families review curriculum on soft skills and employment for job seekers? Um, can they do a facility walkthrough? To me, a facility walkthrough is like very low hanging fruit and very safe. Um, so if you're not sure where to start, you can walk your family advisory board through the school and you could ask basic questions about what they're seeing, how they perceive what they're seeing. You can talk about accessibility. You can talk about safety. Um, you can talk about a sense of welcomeness. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do with a facility walkthrough that is very safe. Um, it's a good starting point. 
Families can be educators. I love it when I see schools bring families in to sit on panels to provide educate, education to staff in those early August days of long um, professional development, because you really can feel a different um, shift in the environment when you have a group of families talking about what their experiences have been like. But I say that with the caveat that the group uh, the culture of the school has to be open to hearing that. You don't want to bring families in and put them in an emotionally unsafe uh, circumstance if the school culture isn't one where they're going to be able to hear families talk about both good or negative experiences. So you're going to start by just looking very broadly at your current practices. How are families currently involved? Are they involved at all? You know, it, because keep in mind, this isn't a PTA. This isn't providing family education. This is an advisory council. So right now, how are families involved? You probably have some family members on your school board. You probably have family members on your PTA. You have family members as volunteers in your school. Um, just essentially make a list. How are families showing up in our school every day? And then you're also going to want to talk about how are families not showing up? You know, where do we not see families? Then ask yourself, how are families already providing feedback? How do we get feedback from them? And are the process we, processes we use now working? So um, when we ask, for example, for surveys uh, that are going out by email, you know, are we, do we have a 10% return rate? You know, are we using that feedback? And should we be using it if it only represents 10% you know, of our families? Um, it, are we getting good, solid, consistent feedback from families about their experiences? And then lastly, what systems are in place to take in family guidance and change process and policy around that? And that's where you come into using a family advisory board. Now, all this to say, it's it would be easy to put out a Facebook post and say, we are going to start a special education advisory council. And if you are a parent who has an interest in this, please reach out to us. That would be a super simple thing to do. And you know what? You would have some families respond. You would, you'd probably get um, a number of families who think, yep, I want to do that. But what you really want to be careful about is who you're inviting to the table to ensure that the process works. So some things to just run by you. You want families who can see beyond their own experience. So all of us in the school system, all of you, um, with your own children, I'm sure can say, I've had some really great experiences and I've had some pretty awful experiences. Um, but to be honest, in this role, those experiences don't matter that much. I need to be able to both integrate those experiences into my perspectives, but then see well beyond that, to see that my experiences are not going to match the experiences of many other families at that school. And I need to be able to see beyond my own experiences. If you bring someone in who is really focused on a specific problem that they had maybe that they could not solve, they will stay focused on that problem. And it will be distracting to the agenda of everything else that you're trying to get done. So you do need to be careful about that piece. You want families who can look beyond their own experiences. Um, you want to look at, do the families that you invite or select, are they able to look at what the system needs, even if it doesn't align with their own goals? So an example would be, let's say you have an individual who is very focused on inclusive playgrounds and that's where she wants to go. She wants to build an inclusive playground. You're focused on um, least restrictive environment and how you're going to make some improvements around that. And that's not to say you're not gonna touch on inclusive playgrounds next year, but that's not your focus right now. Um, you may have trouble getting investment in that. So it's important to when you're interviewing those um, advisors that you ask them, what are some topics you're interested in? What are some of your concerns? To get a sense of that. Would you be interested in doing this even if we cannot touch on the concerns that you're bringing up today? Um, are they comfortable sharing their story? So using your story for change is just part of being a family advisor. And so while you don't want them um, deeply set in their own experiences of why they can't see other experiences, perspectives, you do want them to be able to share their story for change. And I can give you some resources to help train families to sort of identify the pieces of their story that are most important when they want to talk about it in a way that can move systems, but not get um, weighed down by it. And then lastly, is that 
family's perspective going to align with the mission and vision and goals of the family advisory council that you're building. Um, and that can be a little bit difficult to ascertain. Um, but as you're interviewing them, that's something to sort of think about. And another piece of this puzzle, which is nobody's favorite piece to talk about is um, when family advisors agree to participate, you need to think about how you can support them in that role. So best practices to provide childcare, if you can provide a meal, transportation, you will not, you likely will not be able to be representative of all the families in the school if you don't provide childcare and transportation. Um, can you provide a stipend? It's not critical, but I think it's important. You're asking families to share their expertise. So if you can provide a small stipend to them for participation um, and then consider public um, acknowledgement. So can you acknowledge the Family Advisory Council, for example, in a social media post or a school newsletter to say we appreciate their time and their input and that you value that? Um, that's another piece of the puzzle that can be helpful. So you're going to start by recruiting advisors. So we talked about those one to two all-in folks. Those are the folks who, the, the best way that I can describe it is, if these are the folks who are so all in that if you have a family advisory council meeting and they hear all of that and some of it goes well and some of it goes poorly, but they hear it all and they go into the lunchroom the next day with the team and somebody says something negative about family advisors, they're going to speak up and say, well, actually, we learned something really helpful from them or here's something we're working on or you know, this process is important to our school, who is really going to be able to speak to it and champion it. You want to consider how advisors will be trained. And that's something I'm happy to help you with. There's a lot of resources out there. And when I say trained, I don't mean you have to train them over the course of six weeks, but you want to give them a couple hour training so they understand their role, the boundaries, they're willing to um, ensure confidentiality and privacy, um, because some of the things you're going to talk about in front of them are, are going to be vulnerable. Um, how often will meetings occur? There's no great answer to that. You can choose what works best for your school. I've seen schools do every other month. I've seen schools do quarterly. I've seen schools do monthly. Um, it really depends on your goals. Um, how will you establish those initial ground rules? What age range and ge geographical area will this particular uh, family advisory council represent? So there's a couple lines of thinking on that. You could have a school-based program, a uh, family advisory council. You could have a district. Family Advisory Council, you could have a Family Advisory Council that crosses several districts and is part of a, a cooperative. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do it, but it comes down to which type of system you're trying to move, because it isn't going to do you a lot of good sometimes to move very small pieces of one particular school with a school advisory council that serves a co-op and covers a lot of schools. So it really just depends on where your focus is. And then how will you gather feedback from families that aren't on the board? Because that is one of, you know, you will have some families who are not represented, but you still want to ensure that they have the ability to provide you some feedback and guidance. So thinking beyond who's actually sitting at the table can give you some uh, good perspectives. And again, back to best practice, because all of you, I'm hoping you're in the planning phase and you still have time to, to um, target some of these. Can you have childcare available, transportation or stipend? You want all the information that you share with families in an advisory council in plain language. So um, we typically will say eighth grade uh, reading level. You want information translated to families in their native language and if at all possible, and I know this is a heavy lift because we struggle with it ourselves, but if at all possible, avoid making families ask you for this because many families won't. So if you know, for example, you're gonna have two um, Spanish speaking families on the council, uh, you wanna make sure that they have the written information in uh, Spanish and that they have an interpreter available. Uh, share the agenda ahead of time. That will really help you control the flow of the meeting. And if you want family input on that ahead of time, just give them the opportunity to um, include their, their thoughts or concerns on the agenda, have our open meeting time. Roles, responsibilities, and time management strategies. Uh, you always want to have a timekeeper in these meetings because some of the topics will be um, emotional and it is easy for families to get off track in sharing stories. 
and if possible, allow in-person and online participation. That can be useful. But also keep in mind that how are you going to control the flow of information if you want to, for example, talk about something very sensitive? Um, really think about what that should look like and what would work well in your setting. Some core, core agreements. So you've got your staff advisors picked. You're starting to think about your families. There's some basic core agreements that seem to make or break whether these work. One is it's confidential. Now, there may be parts of the meeting that aren't confidential, um, but you want to be very transparent about that right from the get go. You know, if you're going to if a family shares a story that is very difficult for them or very vulnerable, or maybe they accidentally shared a staff name, which we generally tell families not to share names of um, staff whenever possible. And the same goes for staff sharing stories about families. Um, but how are you going to ensure some level of confidentiality? And are you? You know, maybe that's not important to you, but then you need to be clear about that as well. Um, how are you going to get meeting participation? So one of the things that, you know, we have a local family advisory council here, and I kind of just watch it from afar at this point, um, but I sort of watch the dynamics of it. One of the struggles they have is getting people to participate and feel comfortable sharing their ideas. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but part of it is they did not set up roles ahead of time. So if you're going to participate as a family advisor in a family advisory council, you will have to, for example, review all the information that we give you ahead of time. You will need to show up to three out of four meetings. We do expect active participation. Uh, I don't want to be on a Zoom meeting with family advisory council and nine of the 12 advisors have their camera off. Um, be very clear about what active participation looks like and what that is um, sort of how it will be enforced. What are the role of outside community members? So can outside community members come and sit and observe? Can they present? Um, what? How are you going to work with families and outside community members who aren't officially part of the council? And when things go awry, when you accidentally picked the an advisor who um, maybe hasn't worked through their own experience enough to be productive on that council or is very distracting, how are you going to deal with the fact that those norms are not uh, working? So how are you going to work with that advisor? Um, and there are some good processes in place to set people up ahead of time to know we will dismiss an advisor who um, is unable to follow through on these agreed upon commitments that we're making before we even get going. Um, but that's difficult. You know, that's difficult no matter how you cut it. Things to avoid. This, this is maybe one of the most important slides. Um, don't just select families who are already involved. So if you have a maybe three or four families, and I see this all the time, who are super involved at the school, it just makes sense to say, hey, you would be great on this family advisory board. And maybe they would, you know, maybe select one of them. But don't, that's super low hanging fruit and you don't want to do that. The same thing with selecting teachers who have a student with a disability. Um, again, low hanging fruit. It's great, but their perspective is going to be very different than other parts of the population of the school. And so really think about, yes, you may want to include them, but you have to be careful about over-relying on families who are already super involved or families who work for the school. And you know that's not always a popular opinion, but um, if, you're, if your goal is to get transparent feedback about real experience, uh, you have to be careful about that. Uh, not offering training to family advisors. There's... Um, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that you can make. And again, a two hour training about role, boundaries, responsibility, confidentiality, things like that can make a big difference. And we're happy to help you with that. Um, selecting staff members as one of those one to two all in folks who aren't really all in, who maybe don't buy into the idea of family engagement in the school system in the way that they would need to for this to work. So really selecting those advisors carefully, selecting meeting times that just don't work for families which this is not popular because um, I struggle, of course, to even ask teachers to, to do evening work because of all they're trying to do during the day. Um, but the reality is you won't get families to be able to attend during a day. Um, you're going to have to have evening meetings if you want families at the table. Trying to do too much too quickly before you have those rules and framework established for what the group is going to look like not developing an effective feedback loop. This is one of the most important ones. 
So think about it like this. If I'm a family member, you invite me, I go through this interview process. You say, we think you'd be great on this council. Would you sit on this council? And I start showing up. Let's say I show up every month and I do this meeting. We talk about certain things, you know, concerns that are coming up or things the school system's working on. They're looking for feedback on, but then I never hear how it went. You see the problem? Families then get disinvested. They think, well, what's the, why are you asking me for my feedback? I have no idea what you're doing with it. So the feedback loop needs to be clear. When you ask families for feedback on a project, let them know, I'm going to come back to you in eight weeks and let you know where we are with this. Or I may come back to you in eight weeks and ask you some more questions around this. But that feedback loop is really important. Lack of administrative buy-in, because sometimes you have to lean into your administration to get movement on some of those systemic policies that the Family Advisory Board is trying to push on. And if you don't have administrative buy-in, and sometimes what I see with administrators who aren't necessarily part of the council is they perceive the council to be, um, this is an opportunity for us to educate families, um, or this is just a kind of another way to bring families into the district, but more like as volunteers. So the idea of it being around systemic quality improvement, that's where the administrative buy-in has to be in. So you have to really make sure that administrators understand what the role of the advisors are and are open to that idea. And then, like I said before, just using um, school employees as family advisors. And again, not because you can't, but I wouldn't over rely on that. I'm not going to dig through all these questions. There is a great resource called CPAC, S-E-P-A-C, um, and it's a handbook, essentially. And I have a link to it at the end, but it is will take, take you through from a written perspective, building a family adv advisory council. Um, but this is some suggestions they made about things a, a community could think about. How do staff and parents show respect for the perspectives and opinions of others? You know, just that could be a night of discussion, right? Um, parents, what do they need to think about? Do I see that by working to help other children with disabilities, I'm still be helping my own child so I can look beyond my experiences? School leaders, administration, I highlighted the green one because I wanted to point that out. Um, does the district foster a culture in which parents feel supported and comfortable enough to speak freely, meaning they're willing to share things that might be uncomfortable in order to make change? Um, so even when families feel, as they say here, frustrated, angry, or disgruntled, you can hear that information, not get defensive about it, and really think about what kind of systems might we change to improve that for families. So just to sort of loop back to this, because I think it's really important, um, common mistakes we see in family advisory implementation, not providing expectations for staff, not carefully selecting families and self-advocates based on what you're looking for in your particular family advisory council, not developing a really clear feedback loop, asking, this is a big one, asking, families or self-advocates to give you feedback on something that can't really be changed. So um, let's say the school has purchased a particular transition curriculum and you bring their curriculum to the Family Advisory Council and you say, we would love it if you would look at this curriculum and give you feedback. They look at it, they come back the next month and they say, this does not speak to the needs of our loved ones. This is not going to help us move the ball in getting them, for example, um, more integrated into their community. This is not what we would have chosen. Well, if the school is already bought into that and they've paid for it and that's what they're gonna use, it was not useful to ask the families for guidance on that because it's not going to be changed. So that's a big one that we see happen all the time. Um, asking advisors too late in a process. So um, if they do a facility walkthrough and you've already decided that the best color of paint that's already been purchased is blue, and families tell you that that color is off-putting, uh, but you can't change it, That's it's too late in the process. Um, and then not being really clear with advisors about their role, because you can't go back to them and hold them accountable for their role if you weren't super clear about what their role was in the beginning. And that can be problematic because a lot of times as people start these family advisory councils, they haven't clarified in their own mind what they want that role to look like. And so it's hard for them to communicate that to the advisors themselves. So that's why it's important to invest in the front end in the development of structure and governance so that you know what that role should look like for you. Here is some more on common pitfalls. I won't dig into it today, but I wanted you to have access to it. 
And so taking a step back, here's, if you're on the fence, if you hear this, part of you might want to run and say, I don't want to do this. This sounds like too much work. I don't want to do it. Some of you may be thinking, well, I'm still in, I'm still willing to consider it. Um, this is what I would do. I would evaluate that current culture. I would go back to the resource on evaluating where we are in our readiness to work in partnership with families and get a sense of that. Um, I'd consider a book study on family advisors and family engagement with staff who might be interested. I would do a survey for families, all families, to ask about family engagement, how they feel about it, get a sense of their perception of school culture and how open they feel like they can be um, in sharing their ideas across the board. Think about a concrete project. I'll give you some ideas in a minute about, hey, if we did this, what would be a concrete project we could tap into right off to get us, get some traction right from the beginning? Um, and then think about, okay, I've done all these things. Do I want to build a family advisory board? Because it is a commitment. If you're not sure where to start, let's, I'm hoping that a couple of you are still hanging in with me and you're thinking, okay, yes, that does sound like a lot, but I still want to do it. I think it could be really beneficial. Um, sometimes you just deciding what projects feel doable can help move you. So these are some projects I have seen have good success. Um, we talked about families as educators. So families providing staff training and you could videotape families. They don't have to be there live. So to so accommodate sort of the struggle of school scheduling, getting families um, on videotape and sharing very specific answers to questions about experiences can be helpful. Um, inclusion and extracurricular program programming. I've seen people work on that. Drafting a mission statement. Um, looking at that school survey that you did to decide whether or not you wanted to do a family advisory board, uh, do a family training event. Again, be careful though. I've seen uh, fam some <laughs> family advisory councils sort of devolve into that because it's easy. So they start out with really wanting to be a family advisory council, but they don't stay focused on quality improvement. They start saying, hey, we're going to have this community member come in and talk about IEP development. We're going to call Family Matters and have them come talk about transition. And though those things are beneficial, that's not what a family advisory council is. So that's something different. Um, before and after school programming for students with disabilities can be a helpful uh, topic. See if you can have a couple family advisory uh, committee members participate on a hiring committee. That's pretty low hanging fruit. Uh, it, introduce the idea of a family advisory committee or members at the school board. And then consider things like a facility walkthrough around accessibility. That can be very helpful. And again, non-threatening. So in summary, um, select family advisors and group facilitators with care, provide training and prep to the whole school. Make, make sure the whole school knows we're doing this. This is why we're doing it. This is why it's gonna be helpful. This is something we value. Um, establish a clear mission statement and build your group around what that mission statement is. So um, I have a checklist that I will give all of you. And the very first thing is, why are you doing this? What is your why? Because you're going to build the entire advisory council around that. Um, include school administrators at every step. Focus on those small wins. If you do a family advisory walkthrough of your facility and you find three areas of accessibility that could be addressed, that is a huge win. You've done something really significant. So really think about small wins for the first six months and then evaluate the process. Look at it at 30 days, 90 days, six months, what is working. And it's not just the group facilitators evaluating it. It's the actual advisor saying, is this working for us? Do we feel like we're adding to the school culture? Um, are we being heard? What are we concerned about? Um, everybody in the process participates in that survey because you want it to be as effective as possible. And the only way to know that is to ask those questions. If you want to learn more, I'm not gonna play this now, but this is an excellent video and sometimes can help get administrative buy-in around family engagement. Um, so I put it in here and some of you are very familiar with Cadre, I'm guessing, um, but this is from Cadre. And then la lastly, I just put out there, if we say we value family input, which every school system will say, you have to demonstrate that by putting it into measurable and sustainable action. And this is one way to do that. Uh, so I hope that you all will consider um, biting that off. I know that it's a lot. And here are resources. Um, 
I will say if your school receives Title I funding, there are some requirements around family engagement that can help you. Um, but here, are, there's quite a bit around family engagement. And the CPAC right here, S-E-P-A-C, is where I would start if you're not sure which one you want to read first. That will help guide you. Um, are there questions or concerns? Is it different than what you were thinking in your mind? Um, I just want to, you said that we would hit, get access to this presentation. Okay, cool. Because there's a lot of really helpful links in there and some nice things to... Um, put together for staff that want to help us start this. Yeah, we will send all of that and I okay. can send a couple other resources with it. Awesome. Thank you. I did go ahead and put that CPAC one in the chat so that you have that one kind of as at least a, a jumping off point until you hear from me again with the other resources. Megan, I do have a question for you. Um, I've been, I was a part of a, when I was in working in the schools, part of that family advisory council as an educator, mm -hmm. um, but part of that, I know it, it has to be very agenda driven and I appreciated the things because often we would go very off task. Mm -hmm. So do you see, even after you get started and I like presenting, like here is, here's the purpose right away and here's kind of a task that we want everybody to do. Do you foresee it kind of remaining like that? Like we have a, a task that we want to address every time rather than it being like you have multiple things on an agenda where, you know, it can kind of go off the rails just a little bit or, or things like that, because people are very passionate when we're in those types of meetings and we want it to be a very productive meeting rather than something where we're backtracking a little bit. So do you, do you see it like things being really focused on like one or two items every single time or kind of, do you know what I mean? Like a couple of different projects rather than we're going, we're, you know, we're looking at all of these different things and we want to address them. And it's almost, it's too, too open potentially. I have a couple of thoughts. One is you want to, for sure, no matter how you decide to set your agenda, use a timekeeper. You want it to be a staff person because a family member is not going to be comfortable saying your time is up. Okay. So a timekeeper always. Second, I would start, um, like you said, with the first, think about like maybe the first three meetings to be very concrete like that. So you have, you're going to address this, this, and this. Um, on those, and then you'll have a better sense of the flow and who you have in the room. But the other thing I would do, which seems to make a big difference is that very first meeting is a closed meeting. Um, maybe it's training, but at that meeting, you let everybody tell their story. You say to them, help them get used to the time. You know, you're, you have six minutes. I'm going to stop you at six minutes. Tell us about your experiences, because sometimes it's just that need to like say it one time. And if you don't let me say it, I'm going to bring it up every time until I feel heard that gives them that opportunity to put it out there. Um, so that would be, now the other issue with this though, is you get, maybe you get to the point where you're have maybe a little bit more flexibility in the agenda. People understand the time issue and all of that, but then you're maybe two years into it and people are stepping off and you're having to bring new people on. And so generally the answer to the question, I think the more structure, the better, even though it can be frustrating, but you have to give parents a chance to tell their story or they can't move past. Any other questions or something that you're doing maybe currently where you feel very successful um, to even share with the other people? Do you have family today. advisory councils already in place? We have some family councils in place for like through 21st century. Um, Jill has um, some family involvement at our transition program. Um, but we're looking to do something a little more broad um, from like a district perspective, and that would be early childhood through age 22. Okay, got it. So you've already sort of defined some parameters just in that, you know. Yeah. Which is yes, great. it's um, we've been thinking about it for two directors now. Um, so we would really like to start implementing this school year. And I think the information that you provided, like I already got in touch with Plainfield School District to see what they're doing. Um, 
I'd love to find other districts to go to to experience their committees just to see what it feels like. Um, but like, I think we're ready and your information is more than I've gotten from anybody. So I'm really excited. Good. That's um, great. I'm so thrilled that you guys are so far along in the process. So keep going. Not any, we're not far along at all. You are though, you are, you know, you're ready. The to only thing I've done up. is recruited Jill because she's in a type 75 program. I'm like, come on, you're going to help me. <laughs> and I, Melissa, I was thinking of, we have a, um, like special education resources fair in March, which is sent out to all special education families in our district. And that focuses a lot on like um, resources once they exit from our program. And that we kind of have built in like um, families as educators. We have a panel. So like a lot of the things that you were talking about, I feel like, okay, yeah, we do that already. And we just call it something different or we have our own tweaks on it. So there's things that I feel like we are doing while I saw that. I was like, oh yeah, we're good at that. Yes, I know. <laughs> but we have to like fold Broad. them all in together. Yes, broadly, <laughs> yes. Anything else? Are there any barriers that you're particularly worried about that you want to run by the group? No, none that are not personal things that I just need to get over. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that though. <laughs> yeah. Time, but you know, we just have to carve the time out and make it a priority. That's all. Well, don't be, don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're happy to provide written resources or to go over what you have or to show up at a meeting by Zoom or, you know, whatever works for you. So we're happy to help this process take hold because we'd love to see this grow. Thank you so much. Anything else? I appreciate you taking the time and what I know is a crazy busy day for most of you. So thank you. And um, it's beautiful outside. So I hope you get five minutes outside today. I know I did put a survey as part of our grant um, that is in the chat and you can just, you don't have to do it right at this very second, but it, if you can click on it, it'll bring it up onto your computer. I'll also in a follow-up email, we'll have all of these slides. This survey link will also be in it. And also if you need a uh, professional development hours, the ISBE evaluation will also be in that email and it'll generate those professional development hours for you. So that'll all come in a follow-up email. So, but please, please reach out to Megan for follow-up pieces. So if you, wherever you are in your process, she has, as you see so many resources for that, um, please feel free to reach out to myself as well. My contact information will be in that email that I send out and I can, again, always come back in to Megan as well um, with our staff that we have that they can uh, support you in your continued progress on this, help with resources, help with those pieces. Um, but you know your district and your entity the best as well. So, but we are very much ready to and willing to help you get this going in whatever capacity and whatever that looks like for um, your district, for your entity. So, but we are very excited to have you here today. And Megan did put her email address directly into the chat. And like I said, the email will come directly from me, but I will go ahead and put my email address in the chat as well so that you have that. And depending on where you are, I can also get you information of one of our staff members who works directly in your area too. So that might be a little bit closer, but of course we love online pieces because it does make it easier sometimes to get people from across the state together as well, but it doesn't have to everything be in person. So we are very thankful that you took the time out to be with us today. And please feel free to reach out again and expect that email from me later this afternoon that when we get off. And Megan, thank you so much.